and the official sociological studies were not trustworthy. Still, there was some material available, although the compilers had to be careful. But still, they were workers on the ministerial level. So I gathered these materials bit by bit. One fine day, a man named Johann Talve appeared. We first met in 1975, and he visited again later. We talked. I decided that I would provide him with materials that pertain to Soviet Estonia, the things that were taking place here. It was clear that he was doing work for Radio Free Europe, and that was what I needed. From then on, it became possible to send all sorts of materials abroad and to write letters at the same time, meaning analytical overviews of what was going on here, and also to steal documents and statistical and sociological facts and figures. It took a long time, but finally a change came about when Karl Vaino came to power. Well, he was a truly objectionable character. Towards the end, people had almost begun to accept Gabin, but that was unacceptable to the folks in Moscow. A personnel change was made. Ristlan and his kind that was also unpleasant. That was followed by unrest among the young people in Tallinn and its suppression and all of those events. That was what brought about the so-called Letter of Forty. On September 22, 1980, young people ran wild in Kadriorg when the rock group Propeller wasn't allowed to play. On October 1st and 3rd, thousands of students demonstrated in Tallinn. The police beat many of them brutally. Hundreds were arrested. The young people were upset because of Russification in the schools and demanded that the new Minister of Education, Elsa Grechkina, resign, for she was in charge of implementing this policy. On October 13, 1978, Moscow had adopted a secret decree pertaining to the intensification of the teaching of Russian. The shaping of the Russian-speaking Soviet citizen, a person without ethnic awareness, was to be carried out through the policy of Russification. The language of people's friendship and cooperation was forced upon people. In regard to the decrees, we were obligated to respond to them. Of course, we discussed them within the upper echelons of the Ministry of Education. We made our own decisions in this context. Even so, the first document that our top officials adopted during my tenure was the decision about the teaching of Estonian language as a mother tongue and the teaching of Estonian literature as native literature. That was the first decision. Then came Estonian as a second language in the Russian schools. It was only after that, cautiously and taking our time, that we took these rather robust and final decisions. We did it, but we'd taken precautions first. In the broadest sense, of course, these things did have a certain influence. The increasing pressure of Russification and the ham-fisted quashing of the student demonstrations caused the intelligentsia to protest. At the end of October, a group of intellectuals addressed an open letter to the newspapers in defense of the Estonian language and national culture protesting against the bilingualism that was being one-sidedly expected of Estonians. The number of signatories is what gave the document its name, the Letter of Forty. At the same time, the successes of the Polish Free Trade Union movement Solidarity inspired Eastern Europe and also influenced Estonia.
Comrades, a foodstuffs program is being worked out at the initiative of Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev, which is designed to ensure the development of the entire agro-industrial sector and to definitely result in a sufficient supply of food. A steady stream of words about a highly structured, developed and mature socialist society and a state working on behalf of the people, as well as promises, were designed to conceal the decline that was taking place. The Party Congress in 1986 promised to double the economic potential of the state during the five years to come and to provide every family with an apartment or house. Allow me on behalf of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party and the Government of the Republic to congratulate you again and to express the conviction that you will always contribute all of your strength and energy to the attainment of the new objectives of the party. I wish you all success in approving the decisions of the 26th Party Congress. November 15th, 1245. The geriatric leadership in Moscow went through four successions of national leaders during the span of two years and four months. Brezhnev, Andropov and Chernenko were followed by Mikhail Gorbachev, who was a mere 54 years old. His objective was to strengthen the socialist system by increasing the tempo of economic development and by relaxing political pressure. Glasnost proceeded at a faster pace in Moscow and Leningrad than it did in the Union Republics. Karl Vaino, the party leader of the ESSR, was at the very front line of the war against imperialistic ideology along with his brutal lieutenants, and the Bureau of the Central Committee of the ECP went about business as usual in the usual Bolshevik mentality. I was totally blacklisted for a year, no radio or TV appearances. I was also not allowed to set foot on the stages of any of our theaters. This ban was sent to all of the departments of culture of all of the regions and even to the houses of culture, which effectively kept me from performing with bands. I wasn't allowed to perform comedy acts, a total ban on appearing anywhere. And then the so-called elections rolled around again. An agitator came to visit. Hello, elections are going to be held. So what? Well, do you intend to come and cast your vote? No, we never vote, out of principle. This all took place in Russian. You must be kidding. I was under the impression that it's a voluntary act. What do you mean, voluntary? Yes, voluntary. Goodbye. And then it turned out that this guy had previously been a Central Committee instructor. Before the 45th anniversary of the restoration of Soviet power in Estonia, a day of the Estonian SSR was held at the Foreign Ministry of the Soviet Union. A press conference was given by Indrek Tome, first deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers of the Estonian SSR. Indrek Tome and other leading representatives of our republic answered many questions. The chairman of the presidium of our Supreme Soviet, Arnold Rüttel, showed foreign journalists visiting Estonia all that has been accomplished. He spoke of problems and plans for the future. 